Uh, hey guys, I'm Karthi. Uh, yeah, so I have about uh, 16 years of experience in, you know, in the marketing space. Uh, I predominantly worked in the tech industry and I worked for companies like LSF, obviously, WSO2 for a little bit, Camps, Holborn Assets. And currently, I'm like a consultant who advises companies on how to set up their marketing processes. And I also manage Camps' end-to-end uh, -end e-learning platform. Lavi, over to you. Sure. So, um, currently co-founder, chief revenue officer of India's largest 100% plant-based food distribution company. Uh, prior to that, I wore, uh, wore several hats, uh, uh, VC, uh, advisor to companies both here in India, where I am located, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, I was general manager Asia for CAMS, uh, Global Head of Sales of WSO2, which is uh, where Kartika and I first met. Um, XPWC Red Hat. I hate to say how, much, how many years of experience because I think it's, it's on the 30 mark right now, right? 25, 30 years. Um, and I did leave uh, and work uh, for about 20, 20, uh, 25 years in the US. So I do have that background as well. So that's, that's just a little bit about me. Um, I'm looking forward to sort of uh, interacting with you uh, all on the call as well. So um, let's get started, Kartika. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get in, dive into the agenda, guys. So, um, so the, the, the way we've kind of structured this is to kind of uh, start from, you know, the known, you know, and, and work ourselves down to the future and the possibilities. So the knowns, you know, let's not make two bones about it, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get down to it. It's not very pretty right now, but that's what it is. We've also then come up with a conceptual framework because we want to anchor a lot of the information we're going to throw at you. So Kathika has done a great job of, uh, you know, scouring the globe to come up with a, a lot of great examples of marketing during the pandemic, which is the next subject that we will talk about. That's a fun part of this whole uh, presentation. Um, that's all of the interesting examples that we've, we have from around the world. Uh, and similarly, in the next segment, we will look at all the new norms, the trends that we think. I mean, look, there's, you know, people can agree or disagree with us. But uh, in, in this sort of pandemic world, as I call it, uh, post lockdown, there are opportunities there are concerns, but there are also opportunities and uh, things that uh, companies, especially those that are in the tech area, uh, those that are in food uh, can, and garments and even tourism can make uh, use of. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that. And again, we're going to draw a lot from examples uh, and from across the world there as well, so, and including Sri Lanka. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then, of course, the last part uh, where we'd like to hear your views, share some of your own experiences with us. We will uh, uh, obviously uh, want you to ask us as many questions and uh, express any concerns you have. Please use the uh, chat feature to send us questions as we sort of go through this uh, as well. And of course, you can raise your hand at the end and ask questions and we'll uh, unmute your mic so you can do that, right? So yep. without further ado, let's dive right in. Yep. So, okay, let's, what are the knowns, right? I mean, let's, nothing to beat around the bush here. Since March, we're in a global recession. The only thing that we don't know is how long it's going to last and how bad it's going to be, right? Is it going to be actually a depression? But look, here's the thought. I mean, it's all doom and gloom right now and everybody's like, oh my God, what's going to happen to us? But a little few sort of snippets from history that I might uh, share with you. So the Black Death, bubonic plague in the, in the 14th century uh, actually ushered in directly and indirectly the Renaissance. And I think, Kartika, you, you were talking earlier today, there's actually uh, many examples in history where catalyst uh, events have actually ended up creating opportunities and done great things for the world. So I, I think, look, guys, it's not all doom and gloom. It is, but there's always a silver lining. Yeah, and that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, anything else to add on that, Kartika? Uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, tagging on to your point, Lavi, is that most recessions and epidemics have always led to some sort of transformation because I think people have had the time and the opportunity and the need to transform. Great. So the other thing is this changes in consumer behavior. So one of the things that you know my uh, <laughs> trainer always says, because I'm, I'm very lax about hitting the gym, is that if you do something uh, continuously for 21 days, it becomes a habit. Now, Unprecedented, in an unprecedented way, all of us, billions of us actually, have been locked in our homes for more than 21 days in some cases. And we've all sort of acquired a whole set of new habits, everything from 
hand washing to, to other things that have become habits now, right? Have transformed yeah. our behavior. So, so in this pandemic, uh, what's happened is on this, especially this lockdown and associated uh, pandemic, we've changed a lot of consumer behaviors and we also change with it consumer expectations. So we now have different expectations as well as, uh, as well. So these are the two things that we should probably explore when we come to the area of looking forward to what we can do to uh, find those silver linings in these dark clouds. And then the last sort of known is, look, it's clear, I mean, from, I mean, everything from, you know, new drugs to vaccines to ventilators to hospital beds and everything else that we are madly innovating at, that we will either have to innovate or die. And that's another known. So all of the companies, irrespective of how big, how small, you will have to innovate. And that's a known, right? So yeah. those are the sort of knowns that we came up with. I'm sure there are more. But um, let's move to, to the conceptual framework then, Karthika. Yeah. So here, okay, uh, Karthika and I are both going to sort of tag team on this a little bit. So brand awareness, I think most people are kind of familiar with this. So this is, you know, essentially what you like the world to know about your company and your brand and yourself, right? Yeah. So that's what you want to put out. Karthika is an expert on how to do this and the tools and what not to do and what to do it correctly and all of that. And, and, and that's, that's an area that people tend to be more familiar with. What people sometimes neglect or not pay attention to is while you put out all these very positive things about yourself, the perception uh, out in the market may be very different. And there's, there's two things that drive that. A lot of it has to do with sort of the, uh, the quality of the, uh, the output that you're putting. And it could also be that companies, I mean, nobody's ever heard of you. So, you know, they don't know what, you, what, you, what you're about. So those, those two things could impact uh, brand perception. But brand perception has a direct impact on your sales, right? So if people don't know uh, much about you then, or have negative things about you, then that uh, doesn't translate into sales. Uh, so we need to just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and now is a good time, Lavi, for people to talk to their customers and understand what the perception of their brand is out there in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, uh, so let's explore this. I mean, we're going to uh, explore this uh, concept, uh, this framework. We're going to keep it at 40,000 feet because, look, uh, it's a very simple concept, but we don't want to sort of expand it or blow it out too much uh, today. But uh, we'll keep it at 40,000 feet so you have something to tie back uh, and anchor things that we are saying as you move forward. Yeah. Okay, so Karthika, you want to take this one? Yeah, so brand awareness, guys. Obviously, as marketers, we all do a whole bunch of things to get the word out there and get the message out about the company, the brand, and how we want others to see ourselves and how we want ourselves to be represented, right? And part of that whole package is you know, the website, your collateral, some of the outreaches that you do in terms of education to your customers, webinars such as these, you know, how-to videos, etc. I'm going to leave community building out of this because that's kind of my punchline. So I'll, I'll come back to that, right? And then if you're an FMCG, especially today, you know, how attractive is your packaging, how eye-catching you are. Obviously, shelves don't exist anymore. But people still post on social media about the goods that they received and how, and how well it was packaged, right? Now, prior to the COVID-19 lockdown, a key source for us in terms of marketers to develop leads were trade shows, exhibitions, you know, meetups and such things. Now, how those sort of physical events will get affected is well, for us yet to be seen, but it is safe to assume in the foreseeable future that such things will be quite in, uh, you know, it, the, they'll be quite limited, right? And then obviously, as you move along the sales cycle, you also have product demos, trials, beta programs, etc. right? And then you also have the paid media campaigns like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, which you use in order to, you know, reach a larger audience, right? So here's how you, here are some of the tools we usually use to uh, generate leads and get the word out there. But what we want to start thinking about right now is how do we limit and still get the word out? Because less is more now. Uh, content is still king, but you have to pick, you know, your battles wisely. Budgets are limited, right? And people's uh, social media feeds and everything are inundated with, you know, uh, different types of brands and, you know, essential goods, services, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit more about how you can use some of this and not use some of this, but still build your pipeline, you know, over time. And I'll come back to the community building thing towards the end 
because uh, uh, it's uh, we will lead you up to it as to why the community building stuff is really important right now. Lavi? Yeah. So on brand uh, on brand perception, um, let's uh, let's do that. Um, so here, uh, I mean, the, this is how people perceive the brand. Now, I, the key thing to look for in this, I'll let you read the rest of it, but uh, is the amount of control that you have in this uh, perception that is out there, right? So, I mean, what customers tell each other about your product and, uh, you know, you don't have much control over that, what they tell analysts, you don't really have much control over that, but you do have a lot of control over the collateral you put out, uh, you know, the so social media posts, uh, right? And most importantly, the buying experience itself. So if, the, if and when the phone rings or the email comes or the web query comes, how you respond to that, how responsive you are, how uh, respectful you are, how attentive you are, all of these things matter uh, in converting these sales. And, and, and there are gonna be less of those coming through. So it is even more important that you pay particular attention to the quality of your buying experience, right? So if you have a website, you're a software as a service company, uh, your e-commerce company, make sure these are seamless processes, right? That work very well with the customer in the in the center of it. If you don't yeah. do that, then you will lose, uh, yeah, create even more band uh, misperception and also not convert. So it's very important. And when, when Ta Kartika talked about doing less, it's a, whatever you do in brand awareness, there's so much you can do. Pick yeah. two, three, four things and do them exceptionally well. Really well. Better yeah. you do a few things really well and not do a whole lot of mediocre brand awareness. Quantity is not the, the barometer here. It should be quality. It's yeah. quality. And also just tying in with brand perception. Buyer perception now has changed thanks to the virtual world and you know the, the, the remote working environment that we live in, right? Um, more mature buyers would have frowned upon like virtual user groups and stuff like that. But those are all in now, right? You, and for a bare minimum amount, you can set up a virtual user group or a virtual conference with zero budget and you can run these things, right? And people are starving for good content and engagement. And again, I'll keep repeating the word community building because I'll come to that right at the end. But please do keep it in mind that you can do a lot of stuff virtually, which will help you in the physical world in, in, in the weeks to come. Yeah. So the next uh, sort of uh, slide that we want to talk about is we're going to leave you with like four fundamentals here, right? Um, some of these are very self-explanatory. So I just want to pick uh, product market fit here. So I, I think Andy uh, Rashleff uh, had a very good quote. He said, if the dogs are eating the dog food, then you can screw up almost anything in the company and you will succeed. Conversely, if the dogs don't eat what, uh, what, you, uh, what you produce, uh, the dog food, then you have zero chance of winning, right? So yeah, eat your own dog food. Yeah. So, no, it has to be edible. So the, the thing is that you have to make sure that whatever, and especially with the new pandemic, post-pandemic world, that you have to revalue your product market fit. See whether, you know, for example, let's say your main market used to be the US, right? Well, maybe that's not the best market anymore. So you might wanna, you know, st stagger your bets a little bit, you know, look for a regional market, look for, certainly have a local market to, to make sure you have some business continuity and sustainability if things uh, go into another lockdown, like they invariably might, be, might do. So just, uh, you know, look at that. Look at the product market fit. Are you targeting the right customers? Should you target different customers? You know, how do you spread your risk, right? So you need to look at that product market fit again. Prepare, spend a lot of time in preparation. Uh, do the research, do it really well. I mean, get down to really, uh, you know, the, the detail micro level, not only the, you know, hey, this is the industry my customers are in. These are the pain points. This is what their competitors are doing. This is what their competitors are not doing. So, you know, at that level of granularity, take this time, this downtime, as you like to call it that, uh, to really prepare the ground for the future. Yeah. Any, you want to talk a little bit about messaging, Karthik, on that one? Or you want to just... Um, use... No, I would like to talk about messaging, but more in the con within the context of what yeah. other brands are doing. Great, let's do that. Let's go to that then. Okay, so uh, so what's what, these ex examples from across the world, right? So Helen Kirkham uh, is a you know world famous uh, sneaker designer. She actually went out on Instagram, held these workshops on how to design sneakers, and she started sharing IP, very much like what Kartika and I are doing today, right? So this this is the new norm. I mean, IP is not some exclusive thing that you can afford now, because if you're going to do community building, to Kartika's point, you you need to start sharing IP. People need to actually see value in these events that yeah. you're holding. In, in, in things that you're sharing. So then they come, become a part of your audience, they engage with you. So there's nothing, you know, if you hold back, then, then you kind of retrograde 
the objective of trying to build a community, trying to build a brand, right? So uh, this is a great example that Helen has done and she's uh, won kudos for this uh, uh, effort that she's- uh, Yeah, shout out to Helen for sure, but tying it back to our four fundamentals, what she's actually doing is preparation. She's doing research. Yeah, great. Next one. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think this is pretty obvious. So Cadbury's, uh, uh, you know, dairy milk silk brand of chocolates. If you've seen the commercials on TV, it's a lot of sort of smearing, sharing candy bars and licking fingers and, and all these things that, you know, frankly, in a pandemic world, you're not going to be able to do anymore. So yeah. this, this, these kinds of advertisements and, uh, and brand messaging will probably have to come off. Yeah. Uh, because and if you're a marketer, pull these ads out immediately because the messaging, going back to the four fundamentals, the messaging no longer resonates with the buyer perception. Sure. Okay. Kathy, are your favorite? <laughs> yeah, this is my all time favorite. So, very recently, as COVID started hitting, um, uh, in the UK, uh, KFC ran a series of ads about how finger licking good their. Um, uh, that you know chicken is and which is true we all understand that it's finger licking good right but guess what happened with all these newfound social distancing and hand washing techniques for 20 seconds uh, people reported the ad to the health commission and KFC was forced to pull the ad out uh, you know of transmission and all of their spots were pulled now in my opinion as a marketer KFC could have still run this ad had they just put one more slide at the end, which said, hey, we know you're, we're finger licking good, but wash your hands first. Exactly, right? And that would have been a nice play on the ad, actually. Yeah. Because re reinforce that their, their chicken is finger licking good, reinforce yep. the fact that they're socially aware and, and, and are conscious of the current situation, and they understand what's going on in the environment that they're working in. So it would, be, it would have been good. Okay, so last opportunity there for KFC. Next slide. Yep. Okay, so like this, I, I think everybody's seen sort of, you know, people have started to sort of bastardize their brand and, and break it apart, their logo, I mean. I, I think that's something that marketers used to cringe uh, if, if it was even a suggested past. But today, everybody from McDonald's who've moved their arches to Chiquita to lots of global brands have actually done this. And Coca-Cola was really smart about what they did here. So, you know, they've used their logo uh, in, a, in a responsible way to uh, communicate a, a public service message here, a PSA. But at the same time, uh, they've sort of made sure that Coca-Cola still remains in the forefront of people's mind. Yeah, and they've, they've stayed true to the, you know, their product market fit, which was always about bringing people together and sharing a Coke. But today what they're saying is you could still do that, but the only way you can be united is by staying apart. Great. Okay. Well, this was, this is, this is also a really good one. Time out became time in. Uh, Kathika, they, they, this is in the UK. Uh, if you guys go yep. to the London version of this online, you'll see they've you know picked up the 25 best uh, Netflix movies you can stream. Uh, they've done a lot of things uh, that you can do from home. So I think they've become really relevant. Uh, they've done the marketing to be very relevant in the in the time frame that they're in. The, 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 yeah, so, so they've adapted their product market fit. Uh, just going back to the four fundamentals, they've adapted their product market fit to suit the changing times. Great. Your okay. favorite, Lavi. I know. So, uh, pub in a box, brilliant idea. Uh, and then they also uh, did the right thing by hiring out of work musicians to deliver this uh, in the areas that they could uh, find them to do that. Uh, you know, I, I think that was a smart move. Uh, the other thing that I, when I first saw the Chipotle uh, saying, hey, let's have lunch together over Zoom, I thought that was really a sort of a crazy idea because the last thing I thought was, I don't want to eat my sandwich in front of other people. So, but you know, I'm obviously not clued into the the times because uh, everybody was talking about Corona beer being, you know, infectious. And, you know, they was talking about how Corona sales would crater. And I think for a time they did, but uh, the last week Nielsen data uh, reported by Credit Suisse says that uh, Corona beer sales have become uh, gone up 50% uh, because they're having happy hours. And in these Zoom happy hours, guess the beer that they're drinking? Corona, yep. right? So uh, that's the silver lining they found. Unfortunately, Mexico has just stopped uh, the production of Corona beer because they don't consider uh, beer to be an essential food item. Unlike here in Haryana, where alcohol is an essential item and they even deliver it to your house. 
you live in the right city lobby anyways just tying it back into community building guys what chipotle corona signature brew all of them are doing really well is bringing their communities together virtually great okay uh, we have a couple more yeah this one's a local one yeah so this is a shout out to eat me global one of our local apps here in sri lanka for some of our global audiences out there um so originally they were a zomato type application uh, where you can discover dishes and order order you know uh, dishes off of restaurants but with the covid 19 crisis and everybody being in lockdown in sri lanka they neatly pivoted their ad uh, their app sorry to uh, be able to order essentials, but without the essential packaging, like buy your own groceries type thing. And also they would always deliver and communicate on the date that they said they would. Those are two things, if you're living in Sri Lanka, you can relate where we've had serious pain points about because we couldn't buy or customize our own grocery pack. We were stuck with essential packs that you know companies were delivering and they would never deliver when they say they would deliver. However, Lavi pointed out they could further pivot. Lavi, you wanna walk us through that? So maybe a couple of pivots, I mean, uh, that they could have done. Uh, one is that they could have, uh, I mean, even, even Zomato India now is is uh, delivering uh, groceries, by the way. So one pivot they could have done was they could have crowdsourced, because I think in these essential packs, you get stuck with a certain number of vegetables and, and staples. Uh, and I'm sure people are running out of, you know, the if they know one way to make pumpkin, uh, uh, you know, they're getting pumpkin every on everything. They probably wonder how, what they're going to do with this pumpkin. So they just could have crowdsourced a bunch of videos on how to um, cook uh, various recipes of pumpkin, right? For example, and just picking pumpkin. But uh, that way they could have created this community of people sharing recipe ideas and, yeah. and how to essentially extend these essentials and, and not sort of be stuck and, and get depressed about the fact that they're eating the same pumpkin dish every, every week. Right. Yeah, and so they could throw in, like you said, Lavi, the other day, they could throw in some of the ingredients that they have available on their app, which is not available outside. Correct. So you could upmarket as well. So yeah. yeah so so that 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 was uh, that was probably a little step that they didn't remember. And I think you could see Jeevan's furiously taking notes now. <laughs> and then the other thing they they might have been able to do also is that I think some some yeah, so there I had startups. I'm just I'm just texting him right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. So the other thing is that the uh, the hotels in Sri Lanka and some restaurants were offering menus and they could have actually uh, added those deliveries as well. Uh, so I guess the Mount Lavinia Hotel and Hilton were uh, advertising and I guess they had logistics problems to get the, the goods to some people. So they, they could have easily tied in to their original customer base and, and even supplied the famous Sri Lankan hot butter cuttlefish to, to people if they craved it and if somebody was offering it in a restaurant. Although Lavi, hot pot of cold fish goes really well with a glass of arak, which most Sri Lankans don't have access to right now. <laughs> I'm a vegan, so hey, you know, <laughs> none of that will appeal to me anyways. <laughs> okay, so the next one, uh, well, you know, this this is really how not to market. So um, Kartika, if you were Dulit, the CEO of Sri Lanka's largest e-commerce company, and you um, were sort of uh, a I guess, raided by the authorities for price gorging. Uh, and actually there were public videos of the, the raid uh, and your brand took a massive hit. What would you have done if you were the CEO uh, in this case? Yeah, so the first thing I would have done is I've taken absolute responsibility for what happened, right? And, this, uh, and uh, parallelly spoken to my marketing people to pull any and all ads that were running on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and then as CEO, I would have outlined concrete next steps as to how I'm going to make up for this lapse in judgment. Uh, A, you know, some of the things off the top of my head that I can say. A, you know, to, uh, giving, returning the money back to the customers, uh, probably with an additional care package to say, hey, we're really sorry, with a personal note from the CEO, me, if I was the CEO. And also, you know, probably announce some sort of CSR or outreach campaign where we're going to say, look, we're extremely sorry about what happened. It was a complete lapse in judgment. But here are some of the things that we're going to do to make it up, back up to the community and Sri Lanka as a country as a whole. Yeah. In, instead of probably blaming foreign exchange rates and problems. And still running ads on FB, obviously. <laughs> so, all right, so that's, that's how not to do something, right? So I, I thought we, get, we need to have a counter example to all the positive ones that we've shown so far. So the next uh, area that we want to go to uh, is... Uh, your favorite airline, uh, Sri Lankan? Kathy, go. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> Lavi says favorite because it's a bit tongue in cheek. 
this is the first time I've ever endorsed a Sri Lankan Airlines, um, you know, uh, advertisement because all this time I've been extremely, extremely condescending of anything that they put out. But I believe for the first time they got it right. And I'm going to just play the, um, uh, mm. play it for you guys. I've, I've just muted the sound because it's just background score, but you could see it and I'll talk to why I think this is great. Great one. Yeah, that's a really good one for a number of reasons, everyone, because what they're saying is they're giving the consumer the reassurance that the tickets have been marked, say, for over a year and they can change their travel dates as and when they want to. And they're also reinforcing the fact that when you travel with them, you know, you get a hospitality, there's warmth, and obviously you come to Sri Lanka for some sort of adventure. So all of that stuff's been marked safe because the ticket has been marked safe. Which is wonderful. I think that, that brought together a positive story on Sri Lanka, a positive story on the airline, and answered a, a question that people have in their mind about tickets. I, I think it, it was very well done. Agreed. Okay, so looking ahead, um, let's look at these these trends, right? Um, these are sort of, you know, we came up with eight because we just came up with eight. But anyway, uh, these should be sort of self-explanatory a little bit, but uh, let me walk you really quickly through it, and then we will actually have examples of these as well, uh, which are fun and exciting, hopefully. So let, let's uh, keep with the theme. So self, self sustain, uh, self um, uh, sufficiency and self reliance. Self reliance, uh, obviously key. I mean, you know, everybody's talking about globalization, but I think with the disruptions in global supply chain, I think people have really gone back to, hey, you know, maybe we should have enough of our own food and have access to this and that, medicines and everything else. Uh, and I think that's really resonated a lot with people. Uh, just a cap interesting factoid for all, all the listeners out there. Uh, I don't know whether you know this, but India supplies 40% of all generic and over-the-counter drugs to the U.S. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, if, if India wanted to, like, give Donald Trump a really bad headache, you know, it could say, hey, look, we want the medicines, all of it, not just uh, uh, hydrochloroquine, but everything, right? So it it's just, just shows how you know, how these global supply chains have really spread across the globe. And, you know, while, you know, people can argue about globalization or not, I think a trend that we can see is certainly people are yearning, customers are yearning for self-sufficiency and, and self-reliance. The next thing is um, contactless and cashless. I think this is a relatively self-explanatory. I'm wondering whether with, with, the, with the pandemic has actually killed uh, uh, COD for cash on delivery yeah. as a business, it probably has. And then so the other question is, the larger question is, has, will this be the new norm? I mean, will we actually go cashless eventually? Uh, digitalization and virtualization, lots of things to talk about here, especially from work, working from home. I think it really exposed the problems across uh, various businesses who obviously were not prepared, uh, hadn't digitalized, so core business suffered. Uh, and then, of course, safe, being safe and, and sanitized, I think this is a, a major theme. There's a lot of opportunity around that. Um, and then the next set. So, I mean, surveillance and pri privacy, I think, you know, look, it's really, this pandemic has really brought to the forefront this question about individual rights and privacy. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty clear uh, that we've all collectively at some point, you know, given up our privacy to be safe. Uh, especially in this pandemic now, whether that persists, whether that's a good thing, bad thing, these debates will come up. And there's also opportunity there for, for companies to make take advantage of. Uh, remote patient monitoring, uh, you know, this was initially technologies that were built for elder care, long-term elder care. Uh, you know, they've got to pivot now to, to uh, you know, treating patients in isolation. Maybe now you get sick, you don't just run to the doctor when you have a flu, you stay home and use telemedicine and you know stay stay away from infecting people wear masks so all of these things uh, virtual care how do you get taken care of how does the doctor listen to your chest there's a lot of things there yep. uh, hyper local supply chains i think this is really apparent to people both in india and sri lanka uh, it's not the big amazon india or keels in sri lanka that came to your rescue it's the the guy who delivers the bread the one two person shops around the corner from where you live 
that's that's who came to your rescue when you needed your food and 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 supplies and that's a, that's the same thing here in india as well so those people have really you know kind of stood up and delivered so we need to explore that there's a lot of opportunity there for to to formalizing that hyper local sector and we have some great examples of that also and the last thing that we came up with is this concept of strange bread fellows so we've seen and we'll sh we'll share some examples of companies that you normally would never put together yeah. have sort of joined right uh, necessity is always a, a good uh, uh, thing here. So they've all joined together and, and created new sort of business relationships. And I think those will continue because people will see the value of doing that, okay? So let's take these and, and let's look at some examples. So another st statistic that kind of, you know, this is a recent New York Times uh, article, March 25th, that just sort of, you know, set me back and said, oh my God, that's an amazing uh, thing. 40% during World War II, 40% of the United States fresh vegetables came from 20 million home gardens because the, most of the men were fighting, right? So, uh, and they were mostly run by women. I think there are a lot of companies in, in Sri Lanka and India that are in this space of, you know, growing things hydroponically, uh, using various kinds of uh, new AI technology. Uh, and, and these companies, if you can essentially miniaturize uh, these maybe larger things to say, add sun, water, and power, uh, and you get your vegetables at your home, I think, yeah. you know, this could be, this would be a significant thing. And this is sort of using the trend and the norm around self-sufficiency and self-reliance. So yeah, I think the key point I'd like to highlight here again is community gardeners. And I'll, I'll obviously towards the end of this wrap session, we'll come back to why we're going on about community. Great. So that's, that's about uh, Pinfresh and AI Grow, which uh, Pinfresh is an Indian company and AI Grow is an Sri Lankan company. Same thing. I think self-reliance, self-sufficiency, I, I think this whole, you know, the world building ventilators, uh, you know, giving Siemens and GE and all these medical device companies a good run for their money is a remarkable story. You know, Mahindra uh, in India uh, building a ventilator for 7,500 Indian rupees in, in three days. Sri Lanka's very own code gen doing that. Uh, Indian Institute's Medical Sciences aims uh, developing one with a smartphone uh, for all of the technology and then very, very small portable one for 30,000 Indian rupees. So there's a lot of these things. So the point yeah. out here is, hey guys, I know, you know, maybe we should look at all these things that we used to spend lots of money on that we would import. And there's a huge business opportunity to, to you know, unleash the innovation that's inherent in, in all of these countries, right? Yeah, and also kind of extend wearable tech to wearable medical tech. Exactly. Right, and shout out to Hema Stula. This is something you probably don't yeah, know, is that they, they're mm -hmm. doing like mobile hospitals where they'll just visit you in your house if you want to. Oh, well, great. Okay, so uh, another thing I think uh, is also another Vega example here, this kind of uh, cubicles or boots to, to uh, disinfect people. Uh, I noticed when I Googled this, there was lots of countries all over the world scrambling to do this. Okay, so this tech is sort of nascent. There's obviously a lot of things. For example, the chemicals are really too harsh. It works better on, on non-porous surfaces. Uh, I mean, you don't want water on you. So if you're going to the airport or the mall uh, out or night, you know, to a dinner, you don't want to be all soaked to the bone. So, you know, th there's still stuff to do here. There's other technologies they can probably explore, UV, ultrasound, uh, you know, all kinds of other things that could do the same thing. And in these boots, it says to really kill Corona, you have to be in there for 10 to, 10 to 30 minutes. So that's also not scalable, right? So there's a lot of things that you, you can work on this space, but imagine just like you have um, metal detectors as you enter a mall or, or a business place, you may have to have these also set up for the future. So there's a market here, right? If you crack it. Okay, Dolce and Gabbana. <laughs> okay, uh, well, you know, I think uh, and you know, big sort of. Uh, I think Sri Lanka and India both have massive kind of garment operations, uh, and I think they are very badly impacted. Uh, uh, and you know, in the foreseeable future, they they they'll be hurt pretty badly. But also, there is a, a an opportunity here because I think there's a new fashion accessory, as Kathika always informs me, and that's a mask and a glove. Right. And potentially, you know, outerwear that you can wear, you know, that maybe you wear something when you're outside, you come in, you hang that and, and outside and then you enter your office or your home. So there's a whole new area of, you know, trying to make these things look less like, you know, you're from the movie Contagion and, you know, it's more fashionable. It's in keeping with your look. So if you're a fashion designer like Lovisa Rongs yeah. or uh, something like that, maybe when you 
you know, sell us wrong, you do something that is also a mask in the same fabric so you don't look kind of weird, right? Uh, so these are things that people and designers can work on. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, if somebody invents a mask that's comfortable, you know, easy, you can easily speak through, people can see you, see your face, you don't look like you're going to rub a bank. I think all of these things, if, you, if somebody cracks that, is going to be pretty significant, right? And maybe the world is that, you know, we have a mask for every occasion. Like when you're going out in the evening, there's a mask that you wear. It's a little bit more fashionable. If you're jogging and working out in the gym, there's a different kind of mask. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I mean, right. But these are things that, you know, are opportunities for companies who want to really get into this and, and work on sort of safety and, and sanitization uh, technologies. Okay. So Dora Kadata. So this, this translates into your doorstep. I wanted to give a shout out to Sandy Salgado who, who put this together in, in one week for the town of Panadura. So this is helping your you know, uh, roadside vendor, your small Kirana or uh, small shop. And she's really done this in one week, brought uh, currently 10 vendors onto this platform. So, uh, and she's really expanded this definition of what you call essential. So essential is not like five vegetables and, and rice, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, feminine hygiene products, it's your paracetamol, right? It may be uh, some vitamins, right? Uh, so, so it's expanded that. So it's offering things like that as well. Uh, and they've made sort of handy baskets as well as individual items. And they've formalized this sector, right? And I think there's a huge opportunity for, for te especially tech companies and, and people in the retail space to get in here and start working on how do we bring all these people that sustained us during a lockdown into yeah. the, you know, get them to be contactless and cashless and still, you know, up, you know, use sort of low end tech, you know, WhatsApps, you know, whatever to get their products into a platform. I think there's a lot of possibility here and it's something that I'm sure you guys are much smarter than figuring out than I am on this, but, but again, great initiative. Okay. I'm seeing we're doing all the talking, but okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Do you want me to take this one? I well, will take it. I'll take, I'll take two minutes and then you take the rest. So yeah. Stella.io is a company that, you know, I, I know, uh, uh, Vikram Chalana, he's the main investor. In, he's out of uh, Washington State in, in the U.S. Uh, great gadget. You know, you have a thing that you put onto your uh, mobile phone. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, in this self-isolation during the pandemic was, hey, I, I know I have a fever. I know my sugar is high or not. I know what my pulse oximeter is telling me. But uh, the doctor has no way to kind of listen to your chest. So this is a stethoscope, right? So this is a stethoscope the device like a hockey puck as well as the thing on the phone you can actually hold it to your chest uh, and, and the, the sound of your chest and all that is uploaded to the cloud and the doctor can then look at it and listen to it um, and tell you whether you should actually enter the hospital or, or, or take, a, take a pill, right? So this is a great way of, you know, essentially enhancing telemedicine also. So ODOC is in there as well. So there's a, you know, obviously platforms now. So in addition to people who are sick with the virus, other people still get sick with other things. They still need to talk to their doctor who's also on lockdown. So yeah. these are new technologies that have really come to the forefront, you know, so as a VC, when I made some investments in telemedicine as well. So this, this area is going to see a resurgence, I think, based on. Yeah. What and let's not forget re local robot. <clears throat> yes. Atlas robot. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So red fellows, red fellows, right? So uh, I think uh, as of yesterday, NetMeds, which is a, one of India's largest online pharma, pharma companies or pharmaceutical companies, they deliver drugs. Um, and they've tied up with Reliance, the Ambani uh, family's uh, company for groceries. So as of yesterday, they're delivering groceries in addition to drugs. So, I mean, I don't think if this pandemic didn't happen, these two would even ever have considered combining forces. Yeah, and I think Sri Lankans can relate. Never would we have thought that Sakosa would be delivering through Pikmi. Yes. And I think there are more of these. I think, I think um, you know, advice to the startups and big companies out there, you know, if you had a head, yeah, if you had a playbook in your head saying, yeah, you know, I can only align or merge or partner with, you know, people, you know, of like mind or like business, forget that. I think you just throw that book out and, and you know, keep your mind open to po potential relationships and partnerships with, you know, people that you wouldn't have considered in the past and you might be surprised. Yeah. So I think this is what uh, will happen. Okay. So. Um, yeah. I remember when I asked you, Lavi, would you ever go on a cruise again? <laughs> Or whether you, you, whether you ever stay in a, go in a plane again or, hotel, yeah. or in a hotel again or any of these things, right? So, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's going to be a hard sell for the cruise industry. You know, we might have a lot of companies going out of business. 
But one of the things that you could do, I mean, this is where I think the technology companies really need to come to fore, is go there and say, hey, if I can have a device, you, you go through a sanitization process when you enter the cruise ship, they give you a, a thing that you apply and, and fixes to your, your person, it's waterproof, you can swim, you can take a shower, not a problem. It tracks your body temperature. It also tracks you know, where you've been inside the ship. So the contact tracing part is automatic if there is an issue. If your temperature goes up you know, uh, and you're not even testing it, it will notify people. And if required, uh, you know, if you see other people also temperature going up that you've essentially had contact with, then the, the cruise ship can obviously now have you know, the, the uh, isolated rooms kept for these purposes, carry doctors. So eventually, if they do this correctly, they can actually market it and say, hey, going on a cruise is safer than going to the mall. Right? Yeah, and there's a massive big data angle to this, right, for marketers. And I'm sure Jeevan, pipe in at any time because you love AI, is that suddenly we have way more information about your consumer and what they're doing, exactly where they are, who they're seated next to, you know, all of that information that's going to now enable you to market in a very, very hyper-localized fashion. Yeah, and, so, and you check into a hotel, you know, they give you a little this thing, you apply it, and, you know, it, it keeps track. Uh, I mean, the privacy concerns is obviously come in, the, you know, the surveillance is there. So these are things that, you know, people may have to make trade-offs, people may like it, may not like it. So, but again, I just, you know, Kathy asked the question and I came up with, you know, sort of blue sky thing there. Basically, but... Alavi is volunteering to be the first guinea pig for contact tracing. Okay. <laughs> nice. We'll put you in touch with uh, Bill Gates. Uh, <laughs> well, why not? Why not? Hey, if you know him. <laughs> but you know, okay. even as a country, right? You go through passport control, you get one, and then you can keep track. If somebody gets a fever, you know, uh, from a high risk company country, you can sort of alert them. Anyway, yeah. uh, this is said to go. Uh, Four thousand uh, Wednesday was Passover, a Jewish, Jewish holiday, and in Ireland and the UK they handed out these um, Seder to go kits to people who are isolated at home so they could celebrate um, the holiday uh, remotely, but, uh, and with all the uh, required, uh, you know, kosher wine, food, uh, prayer book and everything. So I think that those kinds of kits, I mean, I, you can envision, you know, <coughs> future birthday party kits, yeah, party birthday party kits. kits or, you know, friends in multiple cities, maybe you can all party together, have them get the same sort of pack, drink the same wine, drink the same same beer, get a birthday cake, whatever, right? So Yeah, and talking of positives, Lavi, how cool is it that the tea board finally went online after 100 years? The option, yeah. So after 100 years, I think they, they had to go virtual. So if you don't like oh, digitalization and work, virtualization, well, it's sort of going to be forced on you, like, like the tea option experience. Yeah. So it's a good thing. So that's an example of, of in Sri Lanka of virtualization. The world's largest tea option uh, finally went digital. Okay. Uh, one last example, this is uh, contactless uh, cash and carry in, in Singapore, uh, McDonald's. Uh, I think this is going to be the same. I just saw an ad for Domino's here in India. Uh, yeah, for- Uber here and also Pick Me obviously are doing it and Eat Me is doing contactless. Pretty much everyone's doing contactless. Yeah, so this is going to be the new norm, new trend. So there may be opportunities there for people who uh, provide enabling technologies. Okay, so I think this is the last one, right, Kartika? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, where I think there are some questions that were popping up. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to, we wanted to end up in a positive note, right? I really show you that there is a lot of things that companies, and I think just like the Renaissance preceded the, the uh, bubonic plague, yeah. I, I, you know, we are with smart, innovative people. We got, you know, exciting startups. We've got established companies who, you know, stretched themselves out and gone and done fabulous stuff at a short notice. I think we need to harness that stuff and then we can beat this, right? We can come out of it at the other end much better than when we were in, 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 in on this. So we have a couple of questions. Um, what about the marketing? This is from Riza. Uh, what about the uh, market home gardening during and after the pandemic? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because I'm a startup that focuses on being able to initiate home gardening for the local people of Sri Lanka using the concept of hydroponics. Yeah, as I said, I think, I think there's a huge market there. I think you need to package it that way. Uh, I was suggesting to somebody uh, at Pinfresh uh, the other day that, you know, maybe, you know, you do like an AMC, like, you know, not everybody has a green thumb. Like, you know, a, you know, my wife has a green thumb. If I grow something, it'll probably die. So I think what you need to do is to sort of, you know, say, look, I'll come to your house, I'll set it up, but I'll come like once every month, check up on it, check the nutrient levels, uh, you know, put new seeds, whatever. And you, and people yeah. sign up. And you can do it as a 
SaaS model, right? Where people can, it could be like a recurring revenue stream that you build for your company. And the, interestingly, Lavi, just going back to Reza's question, this ties in nicely with the conversation we had the other day where Lavi was saying, after all of this, are people going to forget about the sanitization, about the contact tracing? And I asked the question, as marketers, do we let them forget? Yeah, and we do. We shouldn't. You know, I mean, I think, I think, you know, let's look. Billions of Indians who, uh, or a billion Indians who probably never heard of hand sanitizer now does, and lots of people, including myself, who didn't use to wash hands six, seven times a day now do. So I think, you know, look, there's a lot of change behaviors, and I think people uh, for home gardening, I think there is just definitely going to be a renaissance. I mean, they did it during World War II, as you saw. I, I think this is be a, a a good thing. I think we just have to package it properly so that uh, you can do that. I mean, you could even have the technology embedded in the hydroponics and the garden to alert, to say, hey, look, it's running out of water. So you yeah. on a proactive basis, call them up and say, hey, your plant just told me it needs water, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, these are the things and that- Reza, if I were you, I would piggyback on the home gardening challenge that's going on around Facebook and Twitter right now anyway. Are you, didn't you say that uh, when you contact the government, they've already given- yes. money- the government launched like something called Salvakia where they were where you could order seeds and stuff online and little plants. And when I tried to do that today, they said phase one, a million deliveries have already been done. Wow. So the next question is what are your thoughts on the future of real estate and particularly office set of spaces, co-working? Yeah, I mean you know can I, I think that one? Yeah, yeah, it's too late. Okay, go ahead. I, I have mine. You can take that as well. Yeah, so I, I, um, I have a view on that too. I'm so. sure Jeevan can yeah. talk about it. Actually, Jeevan, I was going to give a shout out to Hatch, anyways, uh, which was I was going to wrap up with this whole concept of community building, right? And uh, the reason real estate, especially companies like Hatch, are going to survive is that they've leveraged the virtual world to start building communities and people with shared ideals and supporting each other which in a post-pandemic world can obviously be extended to a physical environment. So um, it's really important for organizations, even for real estate, and Lavi can relate because he lives in a gated community, is to st- create the sense of community around whatever piece of property or whatever you're trying to sell, so that when the lockdown's over and people can actually come out of their houses, you have these long lasting ideas and shared values that you've built that you can now bring into a physical group. Uh, Jeevan, Jeevan, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah I, I think um, it is, yes, I completely agree. I think um, w- the only reason we're surviving is because we've already built over the last two years a strong community, and which is great. And um, you know, this, this kind of events, and thank you guys so much, uh, because are because of the extended community that we've had and the impact that we've had, right? But um, also, I think in the short term, startups are suffering. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've had about 30% of the startups leave us or, you know, say that they need to leave us because, um, and, and it's funny how they say that because they they don't want to, but, you know, obviously because of the financial economic situation, some of them have to, right? So we've, we've had about uh, 30% of them, them leave us. So I, I think <laughs> um, we have to do a better job of going online and reaching out to as many people as possible, um, which we are, which we are doing uh, as well, um, because short, short to medium term, it's going to be tough for the startups to yeah. to be in these kind of spaces. So there's a Imtiaz is asking a question. Um, um, no, sorry, Sachita, Sachita right? Uh, not sure if you guys recall this data, but how can we get products and services which are not marked essential? So, so look, I think okay. So this is where that strange, question I think you and I talked about as well, right, Lavi? Yeah, so strange bedfellows, right? So the thing is, okay, the government has a certain idea of essential, obviously, uh, but you can always partner with somebody who's doing essentials uh, and expand their portfolio of things that they deliver as essential, right? So if you want to, you know, send a Lois along along with uh, with your uh, food pack, you know, you you know, get together with somebody like uh, uh, Eat Me, uh, sorry, uh, the tape, uh, sorry, the the startup that Jeevan uh, has Eat in me hand. Global. Yeah. Yeah, the name didn't stick. Eat me global, uh, or Dorita, Dora, 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 and you do you do it right, and I think that's that's how you could do that. Uh, you know, are you sort of skirting the the definition? You may be, but but hey, if you're the first to do it, you probably be okay with that. Yeah. Uh, taking then say, uh, if you're a in, video interviewing company in Sri Lanka, what's your thoughts on marketing the product and who and who to sell? So I think here, you know, co- content is sort of. Key 
yeah, key, right? So understand, again, this is product market fit. If you, if you understand who your real target market is and you understand because you've done the preparation, what is the exact pain point that you're trying to solve, right? So what are your potential customers thinking about? What is bothering them? What is hurting them? What are the opportunities they're trying to explore, should be exploring? Well, if you then gear your content and your interviews that way, then of course, I think you will have a market for those videos. Uh, yeah, and yeah. also it's funny, just uh, tagging on to what Lavi said, somebody had very um, succinctly said, Zoom's overnight success was nine years in the making. Yeah, exactly. So Ishani is asking, taking some information from Make Your Own Mask India campaign. Yeah. I've been the revival of a lot of uh, do-it-yourself hacks on social media, such as creating your own sanitizers or even home rem remedies. Do you think this will play a bigger role in the pandemic world? Yeah, I, I, I think self-reliance, right? I mean, self-reliance and self-sufficiency. Uh, you know, I think the more we sort of understand how to, I mean, I don't know how many husbands have hit the kitchen recently to cook. Um, uh, you know, so I think these are all good things, right? We, we end up trying to sort of understanding that fi finally we may want to sort of go back to some of our roots. So I think if companies actually sort of make this more seamless, and I think there's a lot of videos online, you know, curating them, offering these as a package of, you know, here's the five things you can do on lockdown, like in, in uh, sorry, Time Out magazine did. I think these will all, all, all be good things. And I think there is a lot of uh, self-reliance that will come in. I think that's a future trend for sure. Yeah, it, it's self-reliance and also hyper-localization <coughs> because uh, what Ishani can do is then, if she lives in Panadur, for example, partner with Dora Porita and deliver her homemade mask. Yeah. Well, she's actually lived right across from me here in, in Gurgaon, but... Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of IT companies are now focusing on uh, building e-commerce platforms for startups and a lot of stores are going online. What are your thoughts about the future of this on this? Yeah. So I think again, uh, I mean, e-commerce. So I think there's Dorota, uh, there was an example of, you know, using the hyper local need and then building an e-commerce platform to support that. So again, yeah. I think product market fit, you got to see where you can apply this. So, you know, being the next Amazon might not be an option, but being the next sort of Amazon-like thing in a hyper-local setting definitely is possibility. Yeah, and, yeah. and worldwide possibility. It's not just it's just not only here. I mean, other than maybe the U.S., but even there, if you're in, living in a small town, uh, you got you know you got your people around you. It's not Amazon. It's it's a local general store that will help you. So it's not it's not quite that it's just only Sri Lanka or India or you know, the, the less developed countries it's uh, or the less mature markets as we call them. Yeah, now. and the way we see it, this is a great time to be a startup because startups don't have the baggage that larger companies have. And this is a good time for everybody to try what's weird and wonderful because now's the time to be brave and take risks because the fallout is not going to be as bad as what it could have potentially been in a, how could I put this, in a uh, pre-pandemic kind of environment. Because people are more forgiving, you can try out new things. And in a hyper-local scenario, it, it's so focused on such a small community that you can test out pretty much any idea that you have. Yeah. And just uh, something that came to mind, I know that uh, Amazon called me the other day, wanted to offer a whole bunch of free stuff uh, for, the, for the Sri Lankan market. Uh, you know, you'll find that larger companies, both Amazon, Azure, Facebook, yeah. all these people will cut discounts, right? In terms of everything from you know, instances, hosting, digital marketing, right? There will be lots of freebies. So I think if you're a startup, make use of that. I mean, don't sort of, you know, close up and, and run. Uh, leave Hatch, for example, or leave Rework where I have my office. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I think you need to sort of, before you hit the panic button, take, take an assessment of where you are, yeah? Uh, any other questions? Be happy to like open the mic up if somebody has one yeah i think guys um if you have any questions just ask i think uh rather than typing it um can i ask a question from the group um did everyone find this useful um and i, I think a lot have them saying thank you very much um is there something else that you want us to cover maybe uh even lavi and karthi in 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 in, in marketing So David uh, is asking, 
one uh, e-commerce value proposition is that a winner will take it all. So do you think it still be the case? No. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, no, yeah. I think this virus has been a great equalizer in the sense that one, it's just like social media kind of uh, allowed us marketers to reach a whole new uh, you know, slew of consumers that we probably wouldn't have had a chance to reach. This virus is allowing people to uh, reach, reach deeper into the consumer market. And it's also brought a new segment of consumers into the virtual world who probably never would have joined it if this pandemic didn't exist. Yes, that's true. I think a lot of people have gone online. More people have gone online for the basic supplies than, than before. Uh, yeah. And I think like, for example, I give you a concrete personal example. I ordered hand soap uh, about a month ago from Amazon. It's still not here. Neither is my five kilograms of rice. So <laughs> I'm, I have no idea where it is, by the way. Neither does Amazon. So Yeah. And this ties in really well with the whole contact tracing thing, Lavi, which we missed talking about a little bit more. But now that we do have time, contact tracing will probably not be limited to humans. It will probably, it, it'll be more. Uh, so if, if you want to talk, David, about winner takes all in an e-commerce world, uh, in, in a way, it's possible to do that. But you will have to have first mover advantage on what we call contact tracing, which is if I'm a buyer and I'm trying to buy a piece of, you know, a grocery item or a piece of garment or whatever, I want to know who touched it, who made it, where did it come from, how many people's hands did it move through before it got to me? Yes, yeah, so there's a question from Sid saying, hey, uh, what, about, what about contact with the package when it's picked up? So this is where the, sa yes, the safety and the, the sanitary stuff comes in, right? So yeah, I think we are very wary of packaging now. I mean, touching things and boxes. So one thing is this whole traceability, which Sarakita Organics has, for example, on their website. If you go there, you'll see when their vegetables, of, uh, which is a Sri Lankan company, when the vegetables were picked, packed and shipped and when it went to the center and who processed it and all that. So, so, so traceability will be a big thing. But in addition to that, you will have products you will have to build and still have to come where the packaging, for example, has maybe a nanotech, a nanotechnology yeah. filters, repels viruses or, or, or things like that. So or there'll be, be, be a device, you get the package, you use gloves, you put it into this thing and it sanitizes the whole box and then you can open it. I mean, right now my wife, she's got a UV wand um, and so she uses the UV wand on all the packages on my credit card when, when the guy swipes it on the machine, right? So these are, you know, she just got that before the whole pandemic happened and that's- Yeah, interestingly about credit cards, I think uh, some of the more um, like in Australia or in the Europe or the US, they've, they've they've adopted the, um, the non-swiping method of credit cards, which I think us, uh, India, Sri Lanka, have been very slow to adapt. I think that, that would be fast right now. Yeah. So there's another question. Would a 16-year-old have a slightly upper hand when trying to market their product to the market when comparing someone who's 25? Very interesting question. I, I think it depends on the market you're trying to touch, right? So, I mean, if, you, if you're trying to sell to old fogies like me, maybe the 25-year-old might have a better luck at that than a 16-year-old, but... You don't want to buy Boy Scout cookies? Well, I don't know. I mean, so I think there'll be some, uh, I think these advantages, age is really not the, the, the barometer there. I think it depends on, you know, how tuned in you are, how prepared you are, and how much preparation you've done. Uh, so your success, to me, is not contingent more on your age, but more on the preparation you've done. And the, and, and the community that you built around you. And the community you built around and the product market fit research you've done, yeah. And then uh, ad spend, will all uh, MC be greater than MR in the short term to mid term? Will there be a paradigm shift in marketing and ad spend on social platform? Or will it normalize? Well, I think ad spend will reduce. And this goes back to our point, Lavi, where we talked about how big companies will start giving up offers and trying to get people to spend more money. I think, you know, your conversion rates and your, you know, the, the amount of money you spend on uh, Facebook, Instagram for reach and stuff, will reduce, at least in the short term, because uh, uh, companies like Facebook and Instagram and Google will want to encourage consumer spending uh, or you know, company spending. And I believe that they will drop their rates. So somebody had a very good observation, says that the, the biggest UV machine we have is the sun. And he's right. So- uh, yeah. Yeah, Which it, we it, don't have too much access to these days. <laughs> That's in Sri Lanka. We have blazing sun here in New Delhi. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the ideal thing is if you keep your package out for, I think, a day or two in the sun, it will do the same thing. So, yeah, uh, yeah um, except that in, unless it's groceries and you need, do need to, leave, need to open the box, you can definitely leave it out uh, in the sun and that'll take care of it as well. 
then there's another question. I was trying, trying to start up a business and wanted some help with marketing. Would you know any freelancer who could help me with that? This is from Abdul. Um, uh, I know personally any freelancers. I know one really good freelancer. She's uh, co-hosting with me. <laughs> you, you can always ask Kartika. Yeah, uh, you can reach out to me and I'm, I'd be happy to help you. <laughs> Um, do you yeah. want to go through, are there any more questions, Bobby, or do you want to go through some of the really cool wrap-up slides yeah, that we have? Can I flash your wrap-up slide, uh, the, the yeah. community building slide, because I know you're... Yeah. Um, so, guys, I really, really cannot stress enough about this, right? Content is still king, right? But there's a big difference between a content network and a community network. And you can see that today. A community network is interconnected and it's, a, it's not just about sharing content. It's about building relationships, right? And I'll use Hatch as an example because obviously it's, all, it's close to all of our hearts and it's, it's a startup, right? See, so you can use this time to build relationships which you probably wouldn't have been able to do in, in a pre-pandemic world because everybody was moving so fast, right? And the beauty of building relationships, either virtually or physically, is that they're extensible. Like the Hatch community from a physical went very quickly to being a virtual one. And once the lockdown is over, they will very as, as quickly they will, you know, transform into a physical one. And that's why communities are really important because you have a bunch of people who are sharing ideas and sharing content so that it's not all on you and you're not alone. And that's what startups need to do is to band together and find those strange bedfellows either with larger companies or amongst themselves and, you know, be able to survive by building those relationships with your customers, your community, and the, the immediate set of people in your, you know, hyper-localized environment. Right. So the next question is, uh, how about investment sector? So this is a really good question, by the way. Um, so just uh, just three days ago, I, I mean, uh, some of you may know, I've, I've been a VC in the past as well, and I'm now an operating partner of a fund uh, as well. Uh, but uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues in the, in the VC side, and he told me he's actually uh, working five active deals right now. So I, I was actually surprised. So I was like, wow, how come? He says, no, I mean, he's like the, the craziness from VC perspective in the market has gone. People are not asking for crazy valuations. And, uh, and I have, you know, I have a, a portfolio of uh, funds I'm ready to invest. And uh, there are lots of investable companies that hasn't changed. So, you know, he's been, you know, he and his team has been full on. So there's five term sheets that are going to go out uh, hopefully next week. Right. So I think, don't panic, guys. I think there is money still out there. I think if you've got the right business, you know, you demonstrated uh, the ability to scale at a micro level. You've got a good, you know, you've got good dog food that you know dog, dogs eat. You know, I think there is definitely opportunity there, right? I mean, you know, you might not get the crazy valuation. You might not get lots of people throwing crazy money at you. That probably is dead. Yeah. For a good reason, right? Yeah. But, that but bubble then, has burst. Yeah, and that bubble's burst, and that's okay. I, it's probably a good thing. So if you have a solid business, and you have a good idea, and you've shown that you can execute, and you have a good team, people are very important, then I think it's investable, right? And so don't, don't worry about that. It'll, it'll come around. I mean, this shock wave that we're going through, give it a month or two, and, uh, and the smart VC is like my colleague. You know, he's already on it. He's, he's already making investments. So, Lavi, let me ask you in closing a little bit of a question, right? If you were still VP or global head of sales, chief revenue officer, rather, of WSO2, what would you do to market and a middleware company now? Well, you can put the slide up. So, I don't know anybody from my, my past uh, WSO2 is on this call or not, but if you were, uh, this, is how, this, is a, this is the makeover I would do, right? So, you have some great logos that some of which I help bring on board. But uh, the, the point here is, you know, target your marketing. So you sort of bring, you know, what the customer is sort of feeling and impact by, and then bring your technology. So don't say, you know, you have a fast ESV or, uh, you know, X, Y, Z technology, but talk more about how that, you know, your customers use that to transform the business, especially in this time frame, right? So these are some, you know, I mean, I, I know that these numbers are accurate because I'm no longer associated on a day-to-day -day basis with the company, but I'm sure they could come up with these if, if uh, the right accurate numbers mm -hmm. uh, and, the numbers might be even more in terms of the millions. So uh, this would be how I would, you know, Kartika and I would remake their marketing. Yeah. Um, how do you fact? How will this affect accounting services like child accountants, kinds of firms? Um, so yeah, I think, you know, 
I, I don't know, I will still need to submit returns, I am assuming, <laughs> and, uh, and do all of those things. I, I mean, I don't think there's, um, I mean, I don't know, I, ever since uh, GST and monetization hit India, you know, my chart accountant has been really busy. I don't think he's going to be any less busy uh, than uh, because of the pandemic. Um, yeah, In I think- In fact, they would probably be more busy because they would have to help organizations go world over look through what the benefits that each government is offering and how each company can leverage those things. Yeah, I, I mean, very good point. I mean, all the all the incentives that are out there, you know, there's a bunch of regulatory work, I'm sure, also with, you know, layoffs and people, uh, you know, taking pay cuts and everything else. Uh, I'm sure all of those will require accounting services. Yeah. Okay, so we are at uh, 10 minutes past the, the hour. Um, we are happy to sit and stay. If anybody wants to leave, that's fine as well. Uh, or we can wrap up. And, and uh, so up to the uh, organizers of the event, not a problem from our, our perspective. We are happy to take five more minutes of questions if that's, uh, that's fine. Um, again, Lavi, Kathy, thank you so much for this. I think, uh, um, guys, they're happy to take maybe one or two more questions. So if you guys want to put it up, feel free to do it. And... I think a lot of insights there. So thank you so much, guys. Um, a lot of insights for me as well. So really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. You, you, Thanks, you, Jim. you gave me a reason to wear a collared shirt after about a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you still having your psychedelic background, though? I, I'm yeah, just yeah. I can't see. Yeah, I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone's asking, how will it affect accounting firms? Yeah, I think we answered uh, this now. Yeah, OK. Uh, I think I, I hope I have not missed any questions. I thought I was diligent about them. Uh, yeah, I think we've answered all of them. So maybe uh, so someone just asked: Would love ideas on physical products manufacturing segment, uh, possibly non incentive So one of the things they said was um, strange about fellows. So try work with someone who is considered essential, right? I think that's yeah. one of your things. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to add uh, some of the things we're looking at is. Um, possibly going up the value chain. So one of our businesses we do, we sell pipes and stuff for that. And we're trying to work with plumbers. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Well, um, to be the, fair, plumbing is an essential service. Yeah, exactly. But, but, exactly. So we're going to work. A lot of people are looking for, you know, constantly looking for quick help people, quick fix people. I, I, I see so many, you know, uh, women, which because I'm part of one of these women groups, uh, uh, where they say, "Oh, my fridge is broken. Is there somebody who can fix it? My pipes are overflowing. Is there somebody who can fix it?" So definitely, you guys have a market. Yeah, absolutely. So by working with the plumbers, we 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 become an essential yeah. service, right? So that's what we're trying to do now. Um, just just thing. Good. So Asanka is asking, would love ideas on physical products manufacturing segment, non-working from home business. Yeah. So I mean, look. Uh, you know, in the manufacturing sector across the board is, is obviously, you know, waiting to ramp up here in India. It's been a huge issue because most of the immigrant labor has left uh, back to their villages. So even if you were to start manufacturing here in India tomorrow, uh, you know, getting them all back from their villages, uh, you know, is going to take. So they, they are looking at a one month lead time to just start up the factories. Right. Um, so you know, we're going to have those kinds of teething pains for sure. So I'm not going to minimize that by saying, you know, it's all hunky dory. Uh, but at the end of the day, we got to make goods because people will still require them. Uh, I mean, if you're making Mercedes's, then, you know, okay, maybe people may put that off, uh, those kind of luxury buying decisions. But yeah. again, I, I mean, I think eventually once hey, people... Asanka, why don't you have a virtual Lovi Sarang party? Virtual Lovi Sarang party? Yeah, why not? There are so uh, many people who have a Sarang. Yeah. How, how are you chilling with Lovi? Yeah. Or <laughs> chill with Lovi or you know something similar but have a virtual sarang party you know the a more high-end version of the paddle party hey i mean I, I think you really have to think out of the box i think i mean this is the helen Pietram example right i mean she essentially went to you know took her design to the masses i mean maybe that's uh you know maybe also crowdsource ideas on hey if i was to you know make mask out of sarang material you know how would you do it yeah. how would you design it you know, maybe share how you design the sarongs, how you come up with ideas, Asanka. So you build on your own personal design brand, right? And people understand your design thought process. That's also very important because then they say, oh, you know, this is not just a sarong. It's actually architected, right? 
there, there's layers to it. I think that kind of knowledge, because people have the time to engage, yeah. uh, use it. Yeah. I mean, if so you have the little black sarong, you could have the little black mask. You have the active wear sarong, I believe. You could have the active wear mask. And well, masks are non-essential. The fact that they're designer, the current government doesn't care. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helped, Asanka. So, uh, uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, Jivan, I think we can wrap up now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thanks really for having us, Jivan. Thanks, thanks for coming, coming thanks. guys. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.